Okay, let's uh, let's open up. Uh, Art, would you open us in prayer this morning? Father, we thank you for this day of grace, and that we have uh, come together for the purpose of knowing who Jesus Christ is, and that through Him we have eternal life. Pray that we can understand that forgiveness throughout all all the days, throughout the week. And we pray that Barney's message will bring us good understanding, and you'll be glorified in the things we do as we get together. And we thank this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Barney, you know David. And the Psalms had what they call imprecatory prayers, where he prayed evil on his enemies. So I'm wondering if this uh, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil, the Lord reward him according to his works. <laughs> if that's not an imprecatory prayer. I don't know. It's interesting because at one point he says not to hold it to the charge about somebody yeah. else, but at him he didn't say that. Yeah. So that's, that's, in, that's definitely yeah. interesting. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 2. I didn't have a whiteboard and easel brought with me this morning because I decided at the last second to bring the camcorder instead since we're starting to figure out how to videotape. I wanted to get some things on videotape, mainly Lamont and I's song, a little bit here and there. But, um, Anyway, so I may pull a couple of uh, young, capable men, uh, or young guys up here for a physical illustration here in a bit. Genesis chapter... Genesis chapter... Wow. My vision is really blurry this morning. Garage. Yeah. <laughs> Says up the sign up there says, "Please take your garbage with you." But Dad said it looked to him like it said, "Take your garage with you." I wished I had a garage. <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, God in Genesis says, "Let us make man in our image," doesn't he? Somebody find that for me. I'm, I can't One. see. It's in 1. Here we go. 26 and 27. And God said, Let us make man in our image after the likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So you see the picture of the triune being, both in the deity and in the, in the Trinity, in, in the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and you also see it in the form of how man was originally created, right? Spirit, <coughs> soul, and body. Now take that over to First uh, Thessalonians chapter five. I know I've I've used this a lot, but I'm going to use it real quick before I get going. First Thessalonians chapter five. in verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you have the same idea of that those three parts, right? Spirit, soul, and body. It's very important to understand that concept. Because God said, let us make man in our image. Now, we know that in Genesis 3, man, mankind fell, right? He was then, after that point, he was what? Born in sin, and in sin did my mother conceive me, David said, right? So then you have this problem of sin. Go to, uh, well, Isaiah 64, 6, don't go there. It says, all our righteousness are as filthy rags, right? There's nothing that we could do to help ourselves. Go to Romans 3. Romans 3 and verse 10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, 
No, not one, right? There's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. And you see that principle of the problems that mankind has in his degenerate, unbelieving state. Standing. He just he does not have the capabilities to attain the righteousness of God. And by the way, when you understand that, it sheds a lot of light on problems with denominationalism today. Because there's a significant amount of churches that get the very basics wrong. And I'm not trying to throw off on other people. I'm just trying to explain to you that when you do get this down right, it definitely helps you have better clarity about the gospel itself. Go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And verse 21. Galatians 2.21 I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So the idea of working for righteousness in your flesh prior to becoming a Christian, prior to being a new creature in Christ, is not going to happen. You see that idea? That's very important because... There are a lot of belief patterns that get kind of muddy about how it is that God changes you from being a uh, degenerate, unbelieving, uh, disobeying individual to becoming one of service, one of a new creature in Christ. Let me get a couple physical guys up. Daniel and Darren, would you guys come up here for just a second and stand to my right, please? Uh, meanwhile, everybody else go to Ephesians chapter 4, just to my right, since I don't have a board, to my right, there you go, <laughs> Ephesians right. chapter 4, right. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 22, there's two guys described here, okay, that she put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. Okay? The guy in the white is going to be the old man today. No offense, but... Okay? The old man, put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that she put on the new man. Put your arms down by your side. There you go. The new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There's a significant difference between your old man and your new man, okay? But notice that, speaking to Christians here, are those two people together, geographically, in the same place? Well, yeah, yeah. or he wouldn't be telling you to put one of them off, right? So that's what, that's, that's what I want to show you. There, there are two separate individuals in one body with two different ideas, okay? Thank you, let's go. Say something about that illustration. Yes. The person in white would usually, uh, in heaven, everyone's clothes in white. Right. I understand. <laughs> so, um, so you have this idea of uh, an old man and a new man in one form. Okay, and that creates, for lack of a better term, a, con a conundrum, a paradox, a something that sometimes gets pretty confusing, okay? And uh, I want to look at some ideas about that if we can. Your body was born in sin, but when you believed in the death, burial, and resurrection on the cross for your sins, something happened to you. You had it. There was something that happened to you that was a significant change in your life. Go to Romans chapter 10. There again, if you're taking notes, always write the reference down first in case uh, you miss something else. You always have the reference to go back to. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. We literally hear the process. We hear it, right? Faith cometh by hearing. And we see the principle in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 who was the author 
and finisher of our faith. Jesus, right? He was the author and finisher of our faith. So you see there's a principle here of hearing the faith, right? But what else is the Word of God called? Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. In your list of armament for the soldier of Christ, in verse 17 it says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What does a sword do? I mean, anybody ever been in that kind of stuff? You know, you got an edge, you got a blade, you're going to cut something, right? How many people here still shave the old-fashioned way without an electric razor? Once, my, aside from the women, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I'm not biased. No. If you still shave with an old razor, not an electric razor, okay. Once in a while, I do. Okay, I can't. I can't claim to do it all the time, obviously. But <laughs> I'm trying to trying to cut down on that. No pun intended. But anyway, I, I use an electric a lot of times now. But I, every once in a while, I still shave with the old fashioned. Well, you get an edge. You get a piece of metal that's sharp. Then you have the ability to cut something, right? So here we have this, this, this idea of a sword of the Spirit. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And you're going to see a principle here that is important to be able to grasp. Colossians chapter 2. And he's speaking to Christians because in verse 10 he says, And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. A spiritual circumcision, a cutting away of your flesh, happens when you believe the gospel of Christ for yourself. Okay? There's an operation done on you. Let's read more about that. Circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So God does an operation on you. Like it says over there in Philippians 1.6, He who hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Christ. So you see this process of already having a work done on you before that continuing process of your walk. Okay, There's an operation been done on you. God now says, you know what? I use my sword of the Spirit to do something to you when you hurt it. Okay? It's called the faith of the operation. And it's an operation that's done what? Without hands. It's done spiritually because God is not concerned. Let me say it. If I say it the wrong way, I'm trying to say it the wrong way. God is not concerned about your physical body only in the sense that your physical body houses your sin seed. Okay? That's where our flesh, our flesh wants to do what it wants to do. So in order for us to have the spiritual ability to be able to live out the life of Christ in our body, God has to do a work to change that, okay? Because your flesh is going to want to do what it wants to do. So he needed to do something to you, and he does that at the time when you accept what he's, his son has already done for you on the cross. So he calls that an operation, and he says, "In uh, go to the, there's a principle in Hebrews chapter four that shows us how the word of God, the thing that the word of God can do, that further explains the idea of God calling His word the sword of the Spirit." Okay. Also, it help, to me, it helps explain the idea of spiritual circumcision. Like that, that idea of being circumcised not even with hands. Okay. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper 
than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So that first part of that verse shows you that God's Word is what literally cuts away your flesh from your soul and your spirit. That's why God can say, you're a child of God. You're my child. You believe what my son did on the cross for your sins? That's what saves you. Just accepting what Christ did on the cross for your sins. But understanding the ideas involving that. Understanding that there was an operation done on you. The faith of the operation of God. That's what it calls it there in Colossians chapter 2. That's very important to understand that idea. So a sword cuts, doesn't it? It severs. It, it, it divides asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow. How did God do an operation on you? He did it with the sword of the spirit. You're now, you now have an old man and a new man. Okay? Prior to becoming a Christian, you just had the old man. And that old man could not please God. Okay? That's why God says now that you have an old man and a new man over there in Colossians 3. What's the instructions He gives you? Put off, put on. Right? Put off the old man with his deeds and put on the new man which is created in Christ Jesus. Right? So you have an old man and a new man because you are now have a new identity in Christ. Before, you were, your only identity was you, was me, an individual, right? What Barney wants, what Barney thinks, what Barney, you know what I'm saying? That can't glorify God, okay? But there's something that you need to know. Your old man was condemnable by the law, right? Go to Romans chapter 3. The principle here is... Uh, Really good when you when you grasp it. Romans chapter three and verse nineteen. Romans three verse nineteen. Now we know that now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. When I read that verse, I see both sides of that verse and I say, wow, who wants to be guilty? Yeah. Ugh. But were we not guilty before, before God? Sure. Because we're born in sin, right? And you find those principles of that in the latter part of, uh, or in the middle of uh, Romans 5. Sinning, we're just born in sin after Adam, right? So he says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Think about that just for a minute. By the law is the knowledge of sin. And I know that in this passage, I believe in this passage, that it's talking about as an unbeliever, you realizing that you definitely cannot save yourself. You're a sinner, right? Come short of the glory of God. And that's a good thing. Okay? That is a, a something about the law that is actually a good thing. You see that? Kind of like on the way here when I pulled off a 74. I don't know if anybody else saw him or not. Over to the right hand side back in them bushes. Who else saw him? There was a police officer parked back in there behind the bushes. Now, it's somewhat irrelevant if you're not speeding, right? I mean, you noticed it, but whoop to do I know I'm driving speed limit, okay? But if, you, if I was already doing 70, which would have been possible in Mary's van between the exit ramp and him, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, if I was already doing 70, I would have been what? Condemnable! Yep. Because the law is there, and the law says, hey, buddy, speed limit's 55 when you get to that sign, but it's not yet, and you're speeding. The law, by the law, is the knowledge of sin. Okay? The principle of that is important to understand. But there's something else you need to know. Your old man was condemnable by the law, 
But according to Romans 7, go to Romans chapter 7. In verse 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life. Every time I read that first part of that verse, I'm like, how could the law be ordained to life? That's interesting. The commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be on death. Not because of our sin nature, right? Let's keep reading. But sin, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it, the law, slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. See, if something is showing you what you're doing that's it's sin, how is that a bad thing? Now, I realize when you feel condemned because you make bad decisions, I do, okay? I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you, I don't say it. No. I feel that old oh, wretched man syndrome in the latter part of Romans 7 where Paul says, Oh, wretched man, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I'm still living in that old man. Oh, I'm frustrated, bent out of shape. Things aren't going right. I'm just getting irritated. I didn't eat enough. I didn't, I'm, I'm tired. My flesh is like right there at the surface. If one person says one thing, okay, that's your flesh. Okay. It's the reason why the Bible says, Be angry and sin not. By the way, it's not a sin to be angry. God was angry. It says, Be angry and sin not. I've been listening to uh, a CD running back and forth to work, and uh, Brother Jordan says, Well, I wouldn't give plug nickel for somebody that couldn't get mad at something. <laughs> and he's not talking about blowing up. He's saying that had enough convictions to say, You know what? That's just wrong. Okay? The Bible says, Abhor that which is evil to that which is good. Does he say, well, you know, if it's not really a good idea to... No. He says, if abhor it. That's a strong emotion. Have enough righteous indignation because you're close to what God says about something to not just, well, it's not a good idea, but you're on the fence. No. Abhor it. See it for what it is. I was talking to a guy yesterday on the phone for a while, and I, I told him, I said, yeah, I said, sometimes things are just black and white. You can see them a mile away, and you have to make a decision. Driving down the road, see a billboard that's just wrong. Well, I didn't put the billboard up, but i got to drive down the road and see this? That's not right. My boy, no, turn your head the other way. We get home, I call Adam's Sign Company. First I call the PO. Hey, who do I get a hold of? Robert Ulrich from Co Christian Coalition says, call this, this, this number here. Talk to Bob. It's all right. Call the number. Okay. It's wrong. Christians do need to stand up against sin. Amen. Okay? Amen. Now that starts in your home. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe I should say it starts in your heart. Yes. To make that individual decision before God that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But I found out that if I didn't make that decision for myself, I wasn't going to be able to bring that to fruition in my home. Okay? If I wanted to do the wrong thing and think I could get by with it over here and then come home and implement it, it wasn't going to happen. Okay? I personally believe that there's some pastors that need to be able to admit and deal with their own problems in their flesh so they can actually start dealing responsibly with how their wives or daughters dress. I think the biggest reason is why they can't or don't say anything <clears throat> Is because their own conscience won't let them because they have that problem. In your flesh, I got the same problem in my flesh. But until I got honest with it, then I can go, whoa, whoa, stop. Go back in and change that. That's not, that's not presentable, okay? You, you can't really own something until you get honest about it, okay? To be response able is to be able to have the spiritual discernment in your life to go, you know what? That's the fruit of my old man. I made a selfish decision there. That doesn't benefit me. It doesn't benefit my home. It doesn't benefit my what we're doing. You own it. And you own, you own your mistakes too. Now I'm not saying waller in them. Okay? Godly repentance. I'm, I'm sorry. Godly sorrow worketh 
repentance, right? That's for the Christian. Repentance is not for the unbeliever. Repentance is for the Christian. Yeah. Okay? The guy that's already had the changed identity. The new man, right? So he says in verse 11, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just. And by the way, it doesn't say... In verse 11, for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. What a terrible law! It killed me! It doesn't say that. It says, wherefore the law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That's the law. That sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Don't you think if there's two of us in here, an old man and a new man, and that old man still has the ability to sin, and that new man wants to serve Christ, and those two people are both in the same body, don't you think you need to know when you sin? I do. You need to see your old man for who he is. Over there in Romans 6, verse 11, it says, Reckon therefore yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto Christ. But in many, many other verses, it says, Let, yield, put off, put on. So there's a recognition of what Christ did on the cross for your sins. But there's a significant difference in understanding that that old man is still residing in your flesh. The ability to sin is still in your body and will be till the day your physical body dies. That's the conundrum or the, the, the difficult part about teaching between the standing and the state. Teaching about that in, in Christ you're complete. But over here, this old man still wants to do what he wants to do in life. Okay? You need to understand both of those things in order to be able to live daily. Look at 2 Corinthians 4 before I get too far off my notes. 2 Corinthians 4. Years ago, I don't remember who it was, but years ago I heard a guy talking about dying daily and I thought, that doesn't sound right. Why should we have to die daily? Christ died for us on the cross and he crucified us. But look at some ideas here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Boy, we're, they just break. They get sick, they get icky, they get all kinds of issues. Earthen vessels, right? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Look at verse 10. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Doesn't it sound to you like that that's not a one-time death? Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Look at verse 11. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Look at the, the descriptions of both identities in verse 12. So then, death worketh in us, but life in you. Somebody's texting me in the middle of a message. Caleb, hold on two seconds. Never done this before. <laughs> Oh, wow. Caleb will be here next week. <laughs> <laughs> Planning to, he says. I'll have to. He probably thought our message was over. Well, we're not exactly orthodox. Okay. So then death worketh in us. That's your old man. Death works in your old man. Just as much as he does in mine. 
When Barney wants to do what Barney wants to do, that's death. Now, I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about spiritual death. Over there in Genesis 3, when God told Adam, in the day that you reach thereof, thou shalt surely die. Did Adam die physically that day? No. He died spiritually. That's the same type, the same understanding of what he's talking about here. Okay? Because there is a part of us that we need to recognize cannot produce the life that God wants for us. Okay? Go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Brother Jordan's favorite verse. And verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is living in victory. Okay? Recognizing that your old man will only produce negativism, bad ideas, argumentativism, flesh, okay? My way, Frank Sinatra. <coughs> Whatever it is, your flesh will always kill off your spiritual life. It will make it ineffective. So when you feed the bad dog, what happens? The bad dog gets strong. Okay? You feed the good dog, the dog the, the good dog just take care of that old dog. Okay? And that idea is where we, we find to be true in our bodies. It's not a one time thing to reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin, or he would never say right afterwards, yield your members as instruments of righteousness, right? So there's a process, a progression involved in that. Let's see where I'm at in my notes. Uh, Romans 7. I think I taught it already, but Romans 7. I'll try to get through it quickly. And we see Paul's struggle in the flesh. Verse 23. I see another law in my members, in this flesh, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. See those two things going on there? Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Does he not see his body is death? That thing we stand in front of the mirror and find, trying to make it look good and look better. Well, it might look a little different, but is it any different? We need to understand what's important in life. Okay? I'm not saying don't brush your teeth. I'm not saying don't comb your hair, okay? I'm just saying when you're doing those things, remember that you need to feed your spirit. Okay? That's why God says, renew your mind day by day. And, and we go through this a lot, but who has avail availability to all five senses? Somebody help me with the five senses. Touch, taste, See, hear, smell. Is that it? Yeah. Oh, you're right again. Yeah, that's hard. I don't. I don't want to interrupt train sure. of thought, but it kind of goes along with what you're saying. That <laughs> Joyce Pollock sent me a, uh, on Facebook, and and she said the old man is dead. Well, and she left an e out. <laughs> Had a lot old of man is dead. <laughs> the old man is dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I keep thinking of that when you're talking here, but maybe that'll bring your point home. That's <laughs> funny. The old man is dead. That's funny. The old man is dead. <laughs> well, it has to do with letting and reigning and yielding and putting off and putting on. If your old man was dead, annihilated, physically incapable of influencing you spiritually, then where would your spiritual struggle be? There wouldn't be condemnation. There wouldn't be all this negative stuff that we work through in life, would there? Life wouldn't be a struggle. We could <coughs> get up and praise praise God every day like we will in heaven. And that'd be a that'll be a joyous time. 
But believing, and that's a doctrinal issue, by the way, believing that your old man is dead in the sense of annihilated, that you don't have to deal with it anymore. Now, is it true that you can't put him off in the energy of your flesh? Absolutely. I learned Amen. that the hard way. We can't do it. Our walk is no different than our initial salvation in the sense that we can't do it in the energy of our flesh. Okay, that's why he says, Philippians 1, 6, He who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. Now, who prohibits it from performing it? We do. I do. Barney does. Yeah. So, you can't do it. You cannot perform that righteous work inside of you. But the, the realistic part of that is that we're the same people who can prohibit it from happening. And that's very important to know about yourself. I say all the time, we are our own worst enemy. It's not something not going on out there, although that's huge. We do teach on that too. There's a course of this world. Satan got a will. All those things, right? But our biggest enemy is us. Our flesh. That's why over there in Romans 8, let's read that real quick. Romans 8, latter part of Romans 8, verse... 35. Who shall deliver us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Does that sound progressive? For thy sake we are killed all the day long. Well, how many times can you kill somebody? You see what I'm saying? I, I killed him earlier, but I gotta go back and... Well, that's kind of what it says here. You gotta read it the way it's saying it. For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep more the slaughter. Okay? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. <clears throat> For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing out there can separate you from God's love, from what God has planned for you. The only thing, I'm going to make a stipulation here, so pay attention, because this could sound crazy at first. The only thing that is not in that list is us as an individual. It's any other thing that can't separate you. Notice that. Yeah. Paul says over there, but ye have not so learned Christ. He says that you can know the love of Christ in Ephesians 3. Well, if that's true, then there, you can also not know it, right? Mm -hmm. You can also make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that can actually condemn you, right? Romans chapter 8. I told a guy yesterday, another, a fellow preacher of the Grace Movement, that to me, this passage is one of the most important passages that I will haggle over and will go to the carpet for, so to speak, because this passage is what dictates your understanding of how your victorious life is supposed to work. Romans 7 and Romans 8. Go to Romans 8. And I'll go back to Romans 7 first. Verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This is a Christian saying, the body is dead. Who's going to deliver me from that? Why do I have these problems? Verse 25. I thank God. Well, that's who's going to deliver them, right? Through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind. And that isn't your mind, my mind, his mind. No. The mind is the mind of Christ. It's the faith of Christ, okay? So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God but with the flesh, the law of sin. He recognizing that you can still serve the law of sin. You need to know that about yourself. Don't think that just because Christ died on the cross for your sins thousands of years ago, that you no longer have to deal with that. Amen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now understand that you can't deal with it in the energy of your flesh. That's not what I'm saying. But to think that it that you no longer will ever have to deal with that again. I mean, I don't believe in my flesh is annihilated. 
I don't believe that I can't sin anymore. Okay? So when you read a verse like Romans 6, 11, and it says, Reckon therefore yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, know that there's a progression to that that literally you have to understand. He's talking about being dead spiritually. Well, Adam did that back over there in Genesis 3. And then he produced a son to kill his own brother. So being, being dead doesn't always mean to be physically dead, right? So I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. He's recognizing both of those identities, the old man and the new man. Go to Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation. That's what I want in my life. No condemnation, right? But we're not going to do what those new versions do, are we? No. Let's keep reading. To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's those two identities again. See that? If you don't want condemnation in your life, if you don't want to feel bad, if you don't want to live in the tyranny of your flesh anymore, then you've got to learn what that new life in Christ is. You've got to learn to renew your mind. You got to learn to, by the way, the more you read this, you find out that, wow, God even said something about that. I didn't know that. He said something about, hmm, be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So if I'm filled with the Spirit, I'm not going to consume my body with something that's going to actually have power over me. What a concept. <laughs> God gives us answers for all kinds of stuff that we just haven't studied out sometimes. But he says here, verse 2, Romans 8, 2, For the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. By the way, that law of sin and death is that, that old man. Okay? For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. How was the law weak? Through the flesh. The law wasn't the problem. The sin was the problem. Okay? That's huge, hugely important to understand. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after... Wait a minute, wait a minute. So the law, the righteousness of the law is what is fulfilled in us? You ever think about righteousness? Just righteousness is righteousness. Okay? God made the law. Why is it that we always think that the law is bad? Because we can't do it. We can't measure up in the energy of our flesh. We couldn't do it when we were unbelievers, and we can't do it when we were believers. That's what's so that's why it's a death knell to a lot of denominations and a lot of religions to try to produce a man-made standard and make them try to measure up. The Bible says those comparing themselves by themselves are not wise. So when I try to make a man-made standard on the basis of one verse, okay, or something, and I say, wait, 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 wait. this, wait a minute. Now if God has numerous verses that say something is wrong, is it true? Yeah! Then you can teach that. Run with it, you know? But if you try to finagle an idea around or you come up with something yourself that maybe you do in your own home and you're trying to implement it in somebody else's home, wait, 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 wait a minute. In the first place, God's order in the home and in the church, they're not supposed to conflict. God says, I'm ahead of my home. He says, Jeff's ahead of his home. Artists ahead of his home, you know, Ralph's ahead of his home, Art's ahead of his home, Walt's ahead of his home, James ahead of his home. See what I'm saying? There's an order. That's a God-given order, and it's a blessed order. You don't thwart that idea. But that doesn't mean that when you read something in your Bible, and you say, you know what? That brother's got that problem, doesn't he? Wow. How can I go about having the right heart attitude 
considering myself, lest I also be tempted, and go and help that weaker brother out in Christ. Galatians 6. Am I bearing my own burdens so that I can go help somebody else bear theirs? Sometimes I can't do that. I don't know about you guys. My, burdens, <coughs> my own burdens in life get heavy enough that I'm barely bearing my own burdens. I, I get a couple of more and I'm like, oh! You know what I'm saying? You ever fall backwards. It's a terrible feeling because you know you're going to land on the back of your head. So we need to bear our own burdens first. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about learning about that old man, recognizing him for who he is. I wish I could shut that off, but I have no idea how to do it. <laughs> there you go. Crucify that, would you? <laughs> Sin in a believer is condemnable. Okay? I'm not telling you that God is sitting up in heaven mad at you. There's a difference. I'm saying because of what God has already written and the fact that Paul repeats nine of the Ten Commandments except for the ordinance, which was the Sabbath, that when we do sin, when we live in our old man, because we have an indwelling Holy Spirit, there's a conflict of interest doesn't have anything to do with what how God looks at us. He sees us as His children. But it does not and is not supposed to negate the righteousness of the law either. Okay? In fact, that's why He says in Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay? Now go to two verses real quick and I'll try to close this off. Um, Galatians chapter 5. And you see that the answer is simplistic in nature of the problem with the old man and the new man. Galatians 5 and verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. That's that new man, your new man, right? Walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You can't make that old man stop what he's doing. I tried. doesn't work, okay? Romans 13, 14, I told you this story a lot. In the energy of my flesh, I, all I can remember was, make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust of And I was getting rid of these things, and I was going the other way, and I was not stopping at that gas station that sold pornography. I was not going to that video store that sold pornography. I, I made decisions to push those things away, okay? But I missed the very first part of that verse. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not made to do nothing in life but crucify our flesh. The life of Christ takes care of that. Okay? The life of Christ. When you get busy learning how to grow up into the life of Christ, it makes all those temptations get smaller and smaller and smaller. You don't have to starve your flesh in order to be able to live the life of Christ. I'm not saying that maybe some of us shouldn't starve our flesh more. I mean, there's, there's maybe some decisions we make according to our own weaknesses and strengths to be able to say, you know what, that particular thing is a huge weakness of mine. I need to get a handle on that because I'm just, my habits are actually overtaking me in that area. I like too much ice cream. I like whatever it is, okay, too much movies, whatever it is. So I'm going to make a decision. Because I want to grow in this area, okay, I want, to, I want to see some things in my life come to fruition where I'm actually doing things to actually be helpful to my spiritual conduct. I'm going to make those decisions based upon my own weaknesses so that I can actually grow into that area, okay? That's just being responsible with what you know about yourself. So you see those things. So he says... Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Go down to verse 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit. If ye be led of the Spirit. Why does he say it that way? Because the Spirit is not in the business of clipping a leash on your nose and jerking you around where he wants you to go. To have okay? that type of stuff for babies. Yes. A little backpacking. Exactly. God does not want to keep us 
babies and think that everything that we do, he set it up this way where we just go this way and then this way and then this way without any thought process, without any renewing of our minds. He wants us to grow to understand what he thinks about the things that we do in life so that we can make responsible decisions, okay? So he says, If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. That's huge. That makes all kinds of sense. That's the sister verse to Romans 6.14. By the way, Romans 6.14, I don't believe. I know this is a stretch for some grace believers. Romans 6.14 is not a positional standing verse. Go back to Romans 6.14 real quick. To me, this verse proves it's not. But even in the context of Romans 6, it doesn't quite make sense. We're going to read through the context a little bit. Romans 6, verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust of it. Obviously talking to Christians, right? Yeah. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For, on the basis of this information, Sin shall not have dominion over you. Now, wait, stop right there. Does sin sometimes have dominion over you? You're allowed. Exactly. But we said that we cannot do this in the energy of our flesh. Okay? You can't crucify your old man. You have to get into the righteousness of Christ. You have to know, the, know what God wants to uh, have you do. So he says here, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid! The issue with the law is to show that sin might appear exceeding sinful. Okay? If sin is the thing that thwarts us, from serving God in our lives, don't you think that we should be able to see it for what it is? Wouldn't you see that as a good idea? Now, I'm not talking about wallowing in it. I'm talking about recognizing it so you can go lay it at the foot of the cross where it was already paid for. Okay? Because we can't, we can't overcome sin by wallowing in it. We can't overcome sin by, you know, the woe is me mindset. Okay? But we can't even overcome sin by trying to starve it, okay? The thing that overcomes sin is the life of Christ, okay? So he says it's about a decision-making process that's progressive in nature, and we continue to grow into that. For sin shall not have dominion over you, but for you are not under law, but under grace. Well, what does grace teach us? By the way, to me, there again, the passage is talking about your walk what you're doing as a Christian on a day-to-day -day basis. Look at Romans 17, uh, 6, 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now, even if that's talking about the one time when you believe the gospel, is it not true that Paul spent all of Romans 7 talking about the conflict of the old man and the new man? Sure. And that's important because we need to understand it. Go back to Galatians 5 and I'll try to quit. Galatians chapter 5. There again, this is the sister verse to this. He says, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under law. Well, reverse that process. What does that mean? If... If you're not being led of the Spirit, which means that your old man is doing whatever he wants to do, he thinks it's got its rights, it gets to do what Barney wants to do, okay? That old man that says, hey, this is my time, this is what I'm doing right now, okay? I'm driving this way because that guy's, that guy's not doing everything right. Get, get out of my way, I'm on my way to work, you know, the flesh, okay? That old man, if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Well, then if I'm not being led of the Spirit... I'm being led by my flesh, then I'm under the law. Yeah. And you're grieving the Spirit. Exactly. Yes. 
And, and the reason, and that, and that isn't because God wants you to be under the law. It's because we were born under the law. Okay? God says what? 2 Timothy 1.7 God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power and a love and a sound mind. But that doesn't mean that you don't learn that your flesh is your biggest enemy. That doesn't mean that you don't learn that the sin that you have in your mortal flesh is still condemnable by the law. I don't see grace and law as conflicting so much anymore as I did years back. Because if the law is supposed to teach me what sin was and in my walk that sin might appear exceeding sinful. One more verse and we'll quit. First well, Timothy uh, chapter 1. Typically if you're walking in the Spirit under grace uh, and, and you get out of step in the flesh a little bit, that it should turn to be exceeding sinful as the law condemns it. Exactly. First Timothy chapter 1. Instead of, instead of, as so many do, uh, do overlooking it and saying exactly. it's not sin. Exactly. Or not recognizing that we have sin as an issue in our lives in order to learn how to deal with that. Um, Galatians 5.22, I'll quote, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The things that come out of us and out of our fleshly bodies when we are led by the Spirit, those things, he says, against such there's no law. There is no law that, that can condemn the fruits of the Spirit. The righteous, right? That's why we're there in Romans 8, 4, he says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit works inside of believers and it comes out and they're producing the fruits of the Spirit in their life patterns, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, make this temperance, there's no law against that. It, it represents the righteousness of God. Look up that term, homeschool school work. Look up three terms. The righteousness of God, the righteousness of the law, and the righteousness of faith. Look up those three terms in, in, when you're at home and be a brain about it and find out that those terms don't conflict. Righteousness is righteousness. Something that comes from God represents righteousness. Okay? So we need to get rid of this idea of the law being a bad thing. The problem was with the sin. Okay? 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we'll read through here and, and we'll close. Now the end of the commandment, the end of the commandment, okay, is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved aside have, have swerved, have have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law. These guys were wanting to teach the law. Well, what does it say? But understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. They didn't even understand the law correctly. See that? That's huge. Okay, now I'll go into the next verse. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Okay? Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Well, we just read about that. The Spirit of Christ produced the righteousness of Christ in you. Then you're above the law. You were establishing the law. The law is not an issue. And the law shouldn't be an issue in our life. Okay? It's not made for a righteous man, for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves of mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. You mean you're telling me that the law tells us when something is contrary to sound doctrine? What? That's what it says? Read it again. Knowing this that the law, verse 9, knowing this that the law is not made for a righteous man, for the lawless and disobedient, for ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, manslayers, whoremongers, for them that defile themselves of mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Now, if that's not interesting enough, read the next verse. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Paul's gospel says the law is going to show you when you sin. 
When I read that passage, I read that passage, I don't know how many times, and I'm like, can that be right? Paul, our apostle, is telling us in the dispensation of the age of grace that the reason for the law is to show you, as an unbeliever first, that you can't attain the righteousness of God. But also, as a believer, when you lie, when you steal, okay, all those things. To me, that's interesting. The Holy Spirit of God inside of you as a Christian is uniquely designing the members of the body of Christ to live the life of Christ in you, to have the fruits of the Spirit come out of you. And against that, there's no law. No law. The law does not need to be an issue in the dispensation of the age of grace in that it condemns, your, it condemns your flesh. But when you choose to sin, what happens? Like Dad said earlier, Roman, the, the tail end of Romans 4, you grieve the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, Ephesians 4. You grieve the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit wants to live the life of Christ inside of you. That's who your new man is. That's who your new creature, as a new creature in Christ you are, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So understanding the principles of what the law was for and the principles of what the law does. By the way, what does Paul say again, Romans 7? The law is holy and just and good. All those years I was taught that the law was just to show that man as an unbeliever was a sinner. Well, that's true. But I believe now that it actually shows you when you sin too. And that's why Paul repeats nine of the ten commandments. Okay? The law is holy and just and good. Not because he wants us to feel woe is me when we sin. Just so that he can know that we recognize that old man so that we can renew our minds, so that we can start living in the life of Christ, so that we can walk by the faith of Christ, so that we can have that boldness and confidence by the faith of Him, Ephesians 3.12. He wants us to live in the life of Christ. He doesn't want us to feel bad and feel the condemnation of our flesh. Romans 3.31 says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. I believe we establish the law, literally live out the righteousness of the law, Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And that's a neat thing in the dispensation of the age of grace to realize that God was divinely intervening in history, sending His Son to die on the cross for our sins. But He was doing so because he wanted to put his Holy Spirit in the lives, the human lives of sinners, so that they can learn to become saints, so that they can grow up into the love of Christ, so that they can learn to prove the will of God in their lives. That's a neat thing to see. It's exciting. Kind of scary sometimes, but exciting. Okay?